everybody, it's Eddie Trunk, and welcome to this special edition of Trunk Nation on Faction Talk, Sirius XM Channel 103, and of course, the Sirius XM app. For those of you that are longtime listeners, you know that I love to spotlight producers. I've had the honor of speaking to some of the biggest producers and most influential names in rock and metal for a long time now. And I love talking to the producers because you get insights and stories unlike you'll get anywhere else. And we have had everybody from Bob Ezrin to Eddie Kramer, uh, some of the biggest names, Max Norman, some people that have made landmark records, spend almost the entire show talking about their career and the stories behind making those records. This time around, in a brand new producer spotlight, I welcome a guy that I've been trying to connect with to do this for a long time. His name is Mike Varney, and back in 1980, he started a label called Shrapnel Records, which is widely regarded to be the very first label ever focused on heavy metal music. Before Megaforce, before Metal Blade, there was Shrapnel back in 1980. And Mike started his label by putting out a compilation record called U.S. Metal. And from there, Mike quickly became known as the guy to go to to find great guitar players. And Mike was at the forefront of the whole guitar shredding scene. He is the guy that brought the world Ingve Malmsteen and actually brought Ingve from Sweden to the U.S. and has worked with a who's who of guitar players, the elite players, Marty Friedman, Jason Becker, Greg Howe, Richie Kotzen, Paul Gilbert. The list goes on and on and on of the amazing players that Mike has either put records out from or produced or both. He also produced the first Wasp album. And there's an interesting story on how that came to be and working with a young Blackie Lawless. He worked with a band that I loved and produced their first album from Phoenix called Icon. And of course, Mike, later in his career, ended up working with his heroes, people like Michael Schenker and UFO. It's a great conversation. I really think you guys are going to love. We touch on as much of his career as possible and as many of the players as possible that he's worked with. We clearly could not get to all of it in the uh, you know hour 45 that we had, but we get to a lot of it. And the thing you might not know about Varney is he also has several other labels and has a great passion for other types of music. Even though metal and shred guitar was always his thing, he also really loves blues and jazz and has also spent a lot of time uh, championing that music as well. So we really didn't have time to get too deep into that just because I know this being a rock audience, we wanted to stay with that. But you get some great stories here and great insights from Mike Varney. I think you guys are going to really, really enjoy this. And I'm looking forward to he you hearing it. Uh, Mike joined me from his home in Las Vegas on the phone. And we spend the whole rest of the show talking about these guitar players talking about some of the backstories, talking about some of the bands, and those insights are fantastic. So happy to bring to you here on Faction Talk 103 on Trunk Nation, Mike Varney, our latest producer spotlight. Be sure to follow me on social media at Eddie Trunk, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook page for info and updates about everything happening on this show. And we are going to do a very quick break right at the top and then we're going to spend really long extended segments right to the end of Trunk Nation today with Mike Varney. You're going to love this. It's coming up next. All right, we're back. It's Eddie Trunk, and this is Trunk Nation, Sirius XM Channel 103, Faction Talk, and our latest producer spotlight is a guy that I've been trying to wrangle to do this for a very long time, and I'm so excited that we finally do have him. He is a guy that's been behind so many of the guitar players and records that we've certainly loved over the decades, initially through his label Shrapnel Records. Joining me now is Mike Varney. Mike, thanks for some time. This is overdue. I'm glad we had a chance to do it. 
Hi, Eddie. I'm very happy to be here, and I'm, I'm uh, yeah, I'm glad it's finally happening. It's taken quite a while, but thank you for uh, bearing with me and vice versa, and here we are, live. Yeah, right on. yeah, yeah, for sure. So I guess the best place to start is at the very beginning, Mike. I mean, I know that uh, so many of these guitar players came on your radar through writing a column, but what what came first, the column or the label? Take, take me through the earliest history. <laughs> Well, I, I had been a musician, and I'll skip all of that, but I, I did play with a lot of cool people and some people that became well-known later. Uh, and then uh, as a record collector... Well, hold on, hold on, hold was, on, hold on. Let me stop you there. Don't gloss over that. <laughs> tell me, tell the audience about your career as a musician. All right. Well, I don't want to get too deep into it because it'll take a long time. But basically, I, I grew up as a heavy metal you know, guitar player and uh, Michael Schenker, Jerry Moore, even Alan Holdsworth, fusion guitar player, those are like my favorites. I had all the records when I was growing up, and I got every record I could find, anything that was heavy. That was the thing from the time I was, you know, probably seventh grade, heavy, 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 you know. And so um, I was trying to trying to get, you know, different, different hard rock, heavy metal bands together, but I had a chance to join a punk band called The Nuns, and they were playing all these cool gigs. So we ended up playing with television and, and eight shows at uh, the Whiskey with the Dictators, and then with the... Dictators in the Ramones at Winterland and with Brian Ferry at Winterland and, you know, various things like that. I did that for quite a while. Then I, I quit and joined the band. And then about a, after we broke up, about a year later, Huey Lewis joined up with three of those guys and became the news. And then around that time, I started playing with, before that, started playing with John Cipollina from Quicksilver Messenger Service. And we had a, a band with a singer called Rocky Sullivan and, and a record came out on a, uh, on a German label, uh, and uh, then, um, let's take that. Oh, then we started. I started working with Marty Ballon from Jefferson Airplane, Jefferson Starship. He saw me playing with John Cipollina in that band at the old Waldorf, which is a Bill Graham venue. And he wanted to uh, get me in the studio to uh, do some session guitar playing. So I started that. And then I said, Man, I think I could write some better songs uh, with, uh, with your lyrics. He said, Well, let's try it. You know, give it a shot. So I did, and he liked it. So we started recording those. and I brought Jeff Tilson into it, and uh, I had Leonard uh, Hayes and Phil Kenmore from Y&T uh, playing in it. And we played Bill Graham's Old Waldorf and, and some other venues, and we got in Rolling Stone and, uh, gosh, all kinds of other, all kinds of New York Times, LA Times, uh, all kinds of other other press. And then EMI came and bought it, and it was a hour and a half long video. Jesse Bradman was the front person, and and uh, Jesse was uh, was in, with Alda Nova and and in poison at one point, Richie Cotson. Uh, anyway, uh, we uh, had this thing, we made this record and Jeff sang and uh, it didn't do very well. And <laughs> that was in 1980 when it came out. And that's when I said, yeah, I'm doing this label on my own. I'm, you know, I figured I could, I couldn't fail any worse than I failed as a musician. So <laughs> well, what, what's interesting, <laughs> what's interesting there is you said what a big fan of metal you were, and it doesn't sound like much of the music you were making as a musician yourself would fit that category. Uh, I will tell you this. I have a wide palette for music and there's nothing worse than playing something you love in a garage for nobody. So, right. <laughs> So like with the nuns, we played with Blondie, you know, we, we, play, we were playing with all the best Ramones, all the best bands at the time. So I said, okay. And I started, I played bass in that band. And then, uh, yeah, that band with Jeff Pilsen uh, was more of a, uh, it was sort of somewhere like a cheap trick crossed with Emerson Lake and Palmer <laughs> or UK or something. We had a keyboard player named Mark Robertson who went on to have a band called Cairo on Magna Carta, which has got a great keyboard work on it. And Jeff was singing and playing bass and we had a bunch of great, great drummers but at a certain point um i had a chance to introduce uh, jeff to don and george when they were putting the docking together uh and so he got that audition and uh, right around that same time i was uh a little before that i guess in 1980 i started the label and i probably hooked jeff up with them in 82 chronologically i get a little bit messed up but um anyway yeah so uh after all that stuff i found myself as a record collector going to 1980 you know what's you know, why can't I get enough cool records? So I was buying all the imports I could get at Record Exchange in uh, Walnut Creek, which was kind of like the, I think like Johnny's Azula's place or that place in Florida that, you know, all these guys were getting all the cool imports in, you know, and so I was going over there all the time and buying stuff. And I just decided I should start this label. And that was in the summer, I think June of 1980. So I started collecting material uh, for that. 
And, uh, yeah, I just, uh, I just wanted to, I wanted to make records. I just thought that would be the coolest. And as a, a fan who bought so many records up to that point, I was always the person there's one in every town that probably has more records than most people. <laughs> but I always was that guy. I'm still a nut collector right now and I buy stuff every day. Um, but, uh, anyway, yeah, so I started this, uh, label and I thought, well, you know, how can we have like all these great guitarists out of the UK and out of Germany and, all these guys, well, who's better, Michael Shanker, Willie Roth, who's better, Gary Moore, Michael Shanker. But like in America, we had a lot of great guitar players, but clearly I think Hendrix was the guy in the 60s that kind of broke all the rules. Van Halen was the guy in the 70s who broke, 70s who broke all the rules. It was 1980, I was standing at the you know doorway of the future, and I thought, man, I want to try to find the next guy. You know, it's going to be the 80s guy, you know? And so U.S. Metal Unsung Guitar Heroes was the first release. So it was, and this label, I got a business degree and, and, and the, the minor, whatever you want to call it, it was uh, in marketing, you know, and I thought, you know, I don't want to compete with the Columbia Records or whatever. I want to do a label that, you know, my friend Howie Klein at, at the time, who was uh, on 415 Records, uh, which was a, a big new wave uh, label and had to deal with Columbia. Uh, he said something like, yeah, heavy metal, that's dinosaur music. And I said, yeah, but it's my dinosaur music. And you know, it's a, I, I didn't expect things to, to get uh, as big as they did with, with the genre necessarily. I just knew I liked it. And that's why I wanted uh, to do it. And I had other friends that, that thought it was a crazy move because uh, it seemed like, you know, disco was king and punk rock, you know, was it turned into new wave and gotten softened up and, you know, didn't have the edge or the coolness that it had originally. And, but I just wanted to do that and I wanted to really look for guitar players that were great. And I figured, yeah, you know, if I can find 10 guys that are way better than I am, then, you know, that's a good reason for me to retire. <laughs> so that wasn't very hard either. I found a lot of really great guitar players. Well, and yeah, so, no doubt you signed some legendary guitar players, which we're going to get into, but I'm curious. So the first release, so you start a label called Shrapnel and the first release is a compilation which is called U.S. Metal, which is interesting because my friend Brian Slagle started Metal Blade not long after, and his first thing was Metal Massacre, a compilation as well. So, so the idea of putting out a compilation, I, I guess, is a good launching point at that time to try to establish a label, putting out a little sampling of a bunch of different things. Was that the idea at the time? Yeah, um, I, I didn't have a lot of money. And I don't think Brian had a lot of money either. Uh, when Brian and I first met, he had a cool little fanzine, like, you know, ditto it off, you know, on, like at a copy machine. And he was uh, working in a record store and he was one of the real scenesters, you know, guys I'd love to talk to about what's coming up, what's happening, what did he heard. And, you know, so we, we became friends early on before he had uh, Metal Blade. But like you said, it was shortly after, within a year or so. Uh, he was up and running and doing really cool stuff. Um, but yeah, I think we both probably, I mean, I can't speak for him, but I think a lot of it had to do with, uh, you know, finances and then yeah. thinking, okay, if we, if we find 10 great bands, put them on this record, one of them pops or whatever, then, then we've got, you know, we've got our best, at least I'm talking for myself now. I'm just going to, yeah, I figure I got my, my, my best laid out here on 10 artists and, and if, if one or two, you know, become something, then great. I'll make full records with them and, so that's kind of what happened. We, we, you know, put it out and then started making, like we put the rods out, I think on us metal one and then the rods got dropped from Arista. So, uh, the manager, Pete Morticelli, who became, uh, made me a partner in Magna Carta years later, uh, Pete was managing them and Pete gave me the third rods album for shrapnel and, uh, you know, Marty Freeman, you know, the Hawaii record, Marty Freeman was the U S metal guy. So a lot of these guys on U S metal, uh, you know, they had bands or they joined other bands and whatever. And I, I kind of followed up and did full records on the wild dogs, uh, you know, culprit, a, a lot of those bands. So where does the, you know, I know there's history in here of you finding these guitar players because ultimately you started writing a column in a magazine oh, yeah. and they ended up submitting to you. <laughs> Tell me how that all happened. <laughs> okay. Well, um, I was just getting ready to release that Rock Justice record I was mentioning. That's the thing I did with Pilsen and, and, and Leonard and Phil, a live show. Jeff came in later, though. But um, but that that um, that musical uh, 
got reviewed in a bunch of magazines and, 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 you know, and got some good reviews. And, uh, I started, um, I guess jazz Obrick, the, one of the editors, the guitar player contacted me and, uh, he basically thought, Hey, this is a good idea. You've got, you know, when you find guys, let me know, you know? And so, uh, at some point I know that he, re- I think he reviewed the, the rock justice record in there. And I, I it's funny because I ended up at EMI. The only good thing that happened for me bragging rights is they put a picture of me on the cover of billboard with the, with the guitar as an advertisement for the thing, uh, which like I said, failed that we had an hour and a half long video in it. There was no video market in 1980 when it was released <laughs> on video market. So there's no way to promote the thing. But anyway, getting back to your, uh, what you had said, Jazz Ulbricht, a guitar player, contacted me. And so I brought um, a couple guys from the U.S. Metal album, uh, Dan Meblin and Bob Gillis, down to a party at Guitar Player Magazine. And uh, Jazz was just such a, a great guy, the, uh, one of the editors. And uh, I brought the shredders down, and they plugged in and just kicked butt. And so... Um, Anyway, I saw uh, the publisher, associate publisher, or whatever, and I said, maybe editor in chief. And I went over to him and I said, Hey, I got an idea for this column. I said, You know, I like to pick up magazines that read about guys who are on the street that have dreams like I, like, like I had as a guitar player. It's nice to see a guy with a row of Ferraris. I said, But, you know, the average guy that's buying your magazine is a guy on the street, you know, probably works hard, job comes home and plays guitar. And, chase away the blues, you know, and I said, I like to write about those guys. And he was, what do you have in mind? So it's like maybe three guys, every issue. And he said, well, write me a sample. So wrote him a sample. And then they, uh, started putting that out in, uh, in guitar player magazine every month to call them. And I think that, and yeah, that, that was after the label, but it was, it was just right on top of the label. They did an article on the U S metal album in there. And, um, Remember I mentioned a bunch of great Canadian bands and uh, Rick Emmett, who turned out to be a really nice guy, he actually wrote me a letter and said, how could you leave Triumph out? <laughs> I, said, I said, you're right. You're right. So I called him and apologized. And uh, no, I had like Gatto and all these bands mentioned in there, you know, Canadian hard rock. And uh, Triumph was a huge omission. But like today, I, you ask me something, I'm just going to ramble and I'll probably leave somebody out really important and it's not intentional, but right. that's kind of what happened. You took guitar player magazine, invited us to a party. I brought the shredders. They shredded. I then talked to the editor, told him my idea, write a, write a column. So I did some feature stories too. I did an Iron Maiden. I think that was the cover story. And I think Judas Priest and I think Scorpions. I'm not sure if they were all covers. I think they were, but yeah, I did that too. That, that was fun. And, uh, but that's where it all, all, I started getting a flood of demos, not only from the label, but also from, from the magazine call. So yeah, that definitely helped out quite a bit. It was a, it was a great promotional tie in. Sure. Well, it's, 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 uh, it's a great pipeline because here you are, I mean, you're out there and you're providing this press platform, but then (laughs) if you found something that was really special, instead of giving it away to somebody else, you then had your own outlet to put it out through, through shrapnel. So it was a great way to do a and R in that time long before internet and computers and emails or anything like that. So that's a really interesting thing. What was the first guy, Mike, that you, you put out through shrapnel as far as guitar players that you found that way? Oh gosh. Um, let me think for a minute. It would have probably been the Wild Dogs. Um, they were a really a good band. Dean Castronova actually was drummer. And uh, on the first album, I think it's half Dean on drums and half uh, Jamie from Black and Blue on drums. Oh, wow. Of all things. Yeah. And that was an early one. Culprit was an early one. The Rods was an early one. Steeler was probably the first, you know, real project where I said, okay, I'm getting my checkbook out, you know, and there's not much in the account. <laughs> we're gonna we're gonna take a take a shot here. And uh I wanted to do something with Ingve and, and Ron Keel and I'm sorry, Ingve and uh, Billy Sheehan and Leonard Hayes, uh like some kind of instrumental record. And then Ron came up to the house right around the time I was uh looking to put that together and said, you know, hey, I got this thing happening in LA. I brought his wife up and uh and I play him a bunch of guitar players and he said, That's the guy right there. So, so so let me stop you. Let me stop you there. Yeah. So yeah. 
because this is a huge moment and this for me as a rock metal fan was when your label first came on my radar and I worked in a record store right out of high school and I remember selling that Steeler record like crazy uh, when it initially came out. So Ingve comes to you through, Ingve submitted a tape to you through the guitar column, right? Yes, but there's, I got to give, again, I talked about um, the record exchange of Walnut Creek. Bill Burkhardt, the proprietor, the guy that brought all the cool metal to the Bay Area and helped inspire me to, to want to do a label. Uh, Bill had a Swedish exchange student or something come into his store and had a demo of Ingve. When I was over there buying records one day in probably 1981, maybe, or maybe early 82, uh, Bill said, hey, you got to hear this Swedish guy. You know, and, and so I sat down with him. I said, whoa. And he said, he said, well, what do you think? You want to do something with him or something? I said, well, uh, one second there. Um, and I said, well, I, I would, but man, there's immigration. There's the cost of flying a guy over from Europe. You know, there's just, I just wasn't quite ready. I was a guy in my mid twenties. Right. And the idea of making a commitment like that just seemed a little ahead of me, you know, at that time. And so, um, I, uh, I decided that, uh, you know, I, I just was too much for me. So I, I had a, it was a, a, a thought of mine uh, to do something, but then I just got to put it out of my head. And then six months later or so, Ingve sent a demo to the call. And, uh, and then I said, okay, well, this is, you know, this is cool. And by then I'd sold more records. <laughs> so I thought, okay, I, I, maybe I'm ready to do something like that. And uh, so, yeah, that was cool. We got him out there and it, it, it's worked out. So you you good. brought Ingve? Did you physically, not physically, but did you financially pay to bring Ingve to the U.S.? Were you his Were you his pipeline to get to America? Actually, no. Um, I think I was going to pay for the record, right? And I think Ingve was going to get himself to L.A. So I think uh, I think Ingve's grandmother might have come up with the money. I think her name was Maud. I'm not sure though. It's, my memory is not not perfect, but yeah, I think his grandma helped him. I'm so he mistaken. came he came over to play in Steeler. Like he didn't come over just to kind of figure out what he was going to do. No, Did you send no. him Steeler material, and he said, "Yeah, I'll come play on that." Um, I must have, um, but I, if I didn't, he was just so excited about being able to come to America that that he just just came. I must have sent him something, but. It's hard to remember back then. I just know that uh, I have a letter from him where he was just expressing gratitude and really thankful to be able to be able to go out to America and and have a chance to do something. But I didn't realize, and I don't think anybody realized, how much aspirations you know what his aspirations were to do his own thing so soon because he wasn't a, he wasn't a singer, and 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 Steeler was established you know in L.A. But Ron was writing you know the majority of the songs. There's some are co-writes, but I mean he was big part of the writing force and I can see where Ingve, you know, and, and looking back, you know, where, where he would want more. Uh, but, um, at the time it just, it sounded like a great idea because nobody in LA that, that I knew of at the time had anybody that's, you know, could play that style like that. <laughs> you know, it was a very, it was very special. Well, well, Ing so, so it's interesting to me because this is Ingve literally as a kid coming to a, a America where he wanted to get to. And, you, you know, as you know, over the decades, Ingve has had a, has a pretty polarizing history. There's people that really like him. Some people he really turned off. Some people say, you know, egomaniac rubs people the wrong way. Others say he's great. What, what is you, what was your experience with like him at, at that very young age? What, what, what kind of, what kind of person did you find? Um, very headstrong. Uh, pretty cool though. Uh, you know, I mean, I grew to like him more and more as the years went on. Um, personally, but, um, no, he, he was very confident and, uh, very opinionated and like anybody would be that had a huge talent like that, <laughs> you, know, I mean, it, it, you know, in other words, like, I, I don't think anything was unwarranted based on, on, the, on what he was bringing to the table uh, talent wise. And he knew his worth and he knew, you know, where he was in the world as far as guitar players, you know, he, he, he was very confident. Were you able, as Shrapnel Records in its early days, putting out a record like that Steeler record, and then suddenly 
everyone's talking about this guitar player that's on this record. How quickly did you see that happening? And, you, you know, it was a very short window for him and Steeler because he came in, he did it. I don't even know how many live shows he did. And then he was off and then went and did Alcatraz. Was that a tough thing for you that you couldn't, like, really latch on to him and really become the label for Ingve going forward? <laughs> No, I, I was just so happy to be able to make music with great people. It, it, it really wasn't a, I also felt like, hey, I'm 26, however old I, however old I was at the time, you know, what have I proven to anybody to hold them up for five records or whatever? I didn't have any regret for him moving on. I had regret for Steeler, but that didn't become, uh, you know, a, a bigger thing because I, Ron put a lot of work into that and whatnot. Uh, it became kind of a stepping stone, but no, I, I wanted him to move forward. <laughs> so not not necessarily leave Steeler. You know what I'm trying to say? In other words, like I never thought, oh God, I should have signed him to five records because I never felt confident at that time that, that I had the machinery to to guarantee somebody. So anyway, um, yeah, I just didn't feel confident that I had the enough juice at the time to, to tie somebody up for a long time. Is is the Steeler album the biggest selling record in your catalog? You know, I don't think so. Uh, and the reason uh, being uh, that at the time, uh, I didn't have any licensees overseas. It took me uh, some time to establish that. And uh, that's something that I wanted to find the right the right person to work with. And I became Roadrunners, uh, one of their very first, uh, you know, uh, licensors. You know, and, and, and Roadrunner handled uh, shrapnel from part of 1985, I think, uh, going on, uh, you know, for many, many years. Uh, and, I, and so, yeah, Steeler only came out in America. It never was released anywhere else uh, legitimately. Uh, so um, it couldn't really compete with some of the stuff that had a lot of muscle, you know, that sold all over the place. Uh, Vinnie Moore and McAlpine were two of the very biggest ones, obviously, Cacophony and Racer X. but uh, those first couple of things, the the Vinny and and uh, Tony records uh, did really well worldwide. So let let's move on to that then. So talk to me a little bit about where you go from there. Let let's go through some of the the other names. Now Hawaii was Marty Friedman early on, right? Yes, it was. And and Hawaii had a guy named Gary St. Pierre on bass and vocals. Gary became the singer in Vicious Rumors out in California when he moved from Hawaii out in California. And then Vinnie Moore was a guy that I found and suggested to uh, Vicious Rumors. But Vinnie Moore also had his own aspirations. And so once he did the, the Vicious Rumors record, he wanted to, to get on to his own thing too. So um, unfortunately, you know, that could have been cool. He stayed there a while, but when he went solo, that record was, was a big one. So, um, but yeah, there's just all this stuff. A lot of it interrelates like that. So Hawaii and Marty and Gary. Gary went into Vicious Rumors, and then Vinny, Vinny was brought in to play in that band, too, and do the first album, Soldiers of the Night. 